All right, hello again. This is Jeff Scott of Blackhawk Technical College, and I have been going over a series of PowerPoint lectures from the Starting Out with Java from Control Structures Through Objects 6th edition textbook by Tony Gaddis. That is the book that we'll be using for the 152-143 beginning Java programming class for the spring uh, 2016 semester. And I actually want to bring up Chapter 7, not Chapter 8. So I'd like to go over Chapter 7 right now. I've done the first six chapters, just so you can see that if I come in, let's see. And I go into Blackboard. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, and I go to the class beginning Java programming for spring. Or intro to Java programming, I guess it is. And I go down in my tabs over here. I go to the tab for videos. You'll see that the PowerPoints for chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are done. So chapter 7 now, I'm going to probably do the first 11 chapters of the book. <clears throat> so chapter 7 is called Arrays and Array List Class. The difference between an array and an array list, one of the things I talked about in an earlier chapter was the concept of early binding. In Java, when you create an array, an array cannot change its size while the program is running. It can't get bigger smaller, etc. All right. If you want an array to be able to expand at runtime, then it must be late binded. And the way you do that is you use the array list class. All right. And arrays then are early binded, so they're set at compile time. Array lists are late binded, so they're set at runtime. Bottom line, that's the biggest difference between them. So in this chapter, we get an introduction to arrays. We talk about how to process array contents, how to pass arrays as arguments to methods. We go over some useful array algorithms and operations. We return arrays from methods. We talk a little bit about string arrays and arrays of objects. Next, we get into the sequential search algorithm, talk parallel arrays, two-dimensional arrays, Arrays with three or more dimensions, selection sort and binary search, a little bit, and this is the only time really in the book the author discusses command line arguments, and that's that actual string bracket bracket args that you see in main. And finally, we end with the array list class. So, so far everything basically, other than strings, and even, even the regular string itself, but we've talked about, remember those eight primitive variables that we have in Java, and I keep coming back to them. I keep putting them on the screen because I want you to commit them to memory. All right, so again, they are, we've got a byte, we've got a short, we've got an int, we've got a long. And remember, those particular, those four variables are all whole numbers or integer types of variables. We also have float. We have double, and remember that float and double, that both of those, whoops, both of those can have a decimal place. We also have char, and we have boolean, which are our non-numeric types of data there. All right, so those are the Java primitive data types. Or the Java primitives, okay? <clears throat> so those primitive data types, as mentioned here, are designed to hold only a single value at a time. So they are also called simple or elementary data items. When we want to have a collection, so for instance, let's say that I have a class and I've got 15 people in the class. I can create 15 variables. So I can call them student1, student2, student3, student4, and make 15 of those. Or I can create one variable 
which is an array that has 15 compartments in it or 15 elements in it. And I can have students sub zero, students sub one, all the way up through students sub 14. So as it says, arrays allow us to create a collection of like values that are indexed. An array can store any type of data, but only one type at a time. So I can have an array of strings or an array of ints or an array of any of those primitive data types, but I can't mix, I cannot mix, for example, uh, a char and a Boolean, okay? I can have an array of chars or an array of Booleans, but I can't mix them. And an array, as it says, is a list of data elements. Since an array is an object, it needs a reference. This is how you declare an array, okay? That's how you declare an array in Java. And I do want to mention something. I believe the author mentions it in the book, but just in case. So if I want to create an array in Java, I do it like this. The way that you do it in the C programming language is you do it like this. All right, so again, this is the Java way of doing it. And this is the C way of doing it. Now, the only reason I mention that is Java does not care. You can actually create an array in Java like this if you want to. I'm going to ask that you do it the, quote, Java way, unquote, and do it like this. All right. <clears throat> When you create an array, all right, you can do it in two steps like they have here, int numbers, semicolon, then numbers equals new int six, or you can combine that into one line. When you do that, you now have an array with six elements in it, element zero, element one, element two, element three, element four, and element five. Array indexes, as it says, always start at zero. They're sometimes referred to as index zero through five. <clears throat> sometimes it's subscript. 0 through 5, or just sub 0 through 5. And that's usually the way I refer to them. So again, you can have arrays of any type. <clears throat> the array size must be non-negative. It may be a literal value. It can be a constant, or it can be a variable. So here's an example of creating a constant, and then creating an array of that constant size. Here's the key point, though. As we've already discussed, because of the fact that arrays are early binded, once you create an array, the size is fixed and it cannot be changed. And you say, well, what if I have an array and I want it to be able to change sizes, get bigger and smaller? Then you don't want to use an array. You want to use an array list, which we talk about at the end of the chapter. All right? So again, when you access the elements of an array, this is typically read as, as it says here, numbers sub zero or sometimes numbers subscript zero, or sometimes numbers index zero. All right, but most of the time you find people say sub, short for subscript. And again, remember, arrays always start at sub zero. So with an array with six elements, the first element will be element zero. <clears throat> you, can create, you can treat an array like you would any other variable. When you pass an array, an entire array, to a function, you pass it by reference, not by value. So if you pass an entire array, an entire array if you pass it to a, to a function or method, any changes you make are permanent changes. However, if you pass individual array elements, they're just treated as any other variable. <clears throat> so if I pass all of numbers to a method and I change what's in here, it's permanent. If I just pass number zero and I change it in my method, it's a temporary change just within the method itself. Arrays are really designed to work with, with loops, especially for loops. Array indexes start at zero and they go to the length of the array minus one. So again, if we have values here, it will go from zero through nine. This is about the only time when you use for loops that it's okay to use very simple, kind of nonsensical names like i, j, and k. 
All right. I still sometimes use LCV, but sometimes I use I, J, and K. <clears throat> so here's an example. Now, there's an error in here, but we'll talk about that in a minute. What I want you to understand, though, is what this is doing. <clears throat> First of all, I wish they had curly braces around, around this. So I wish the author had done that. And just it's been showing you good habits, and that means doing this. I wish they would have done that. They didn't, but like I said, I just wish that he would have shown it like that. All right, so personally, like I said, I wish it would look like this. So what this is, this is going to do, and there's an error in here, we'll talk about that in a minute, but imagine this said zero, okay? So imagine that this said zero, and this said less than 100. What it's going to do is it's going to take every element and set it equal to 99. Now, what is the error in here? The error is that shouldn't have been a 1. That should have been a 0. And you shouldn't go from 1 to 100 because an array of size 100 goes from 0 to 99. So what the author should have done here, because again, that line is an error, is the author should have come in there and should have actually done it like this, 0 and less than 100. Then you wouldn't have had the error, and that would have been OK. So in other words, that's error, and that is OK. All right, and I'm just putting that in there. You, you may already have said, well, I already knew that. OK, but I want to show you the way that it should be done. The top one, as mentioned on the bottom here, would throw an array index out of bounds exception. Not a good thing. <clears throat> if you've got a small array like this one, you can initialize it. Note two things. First, when you initialize, you put the values in curly braces. You must do that regardless of the data type. Second, if you're not going to if you're going to initialize an array from the beginning, do not put a number in here. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Don't put a 12 in there. Let the system figure out how many values are in there. That's what the recommended way of doing things is. All right, as mentioned previously, if you look at this slide here, it is legit to go in and <clears throat> create an array this way or this way. All right. I don't know why you'd want to do this. Uh, to me, this is just very, very confusing. All right, so the author says that you can do this. I wouldn't do that anyway. So this is a variable, an array of type int. That's just an int to my knowledge, and so is that. And actually, since it's int bracket bracket, these may all be arrays. See, it's confusing. I would never do this. I would put this in three lines, int bracket numbers, semicolon, int bracket code, semicolon, int bracket scores, semicolon. That's the way I want you to do it. All right. As it says, process, processing array data, when you're working with individual elements, they work the same as if you have a simple or a primitive data type. Because when you think about it, each element in an array typically is just an elementary or simple data type. You can use the pre-increment, post-increment, pre-decrement, post-decrement, etc. You can use array elements in relational operations, so in ifs, whiles, switches, etc. Arrays have a built-in property called length. So even though the elements that are in this temperatures array would go from 0 to 24, there are still 25 elements. And the way that you refer to that is the name of the array dot length. So in this case, size would hold 25. When you work with working with loops, if you only want to read through a loop, you can use this what's called enhanced for loop style. It works a little bit faster. Okay, so here's an example. And there is actually a mistake in here because that 4 that's right there should have a lowercase f. 
All right, not an uppercase F. So you, you're saying for int val, this is a variable you're making up on the fly. All right, and you're saying val, which is the type numbers, print out the value of val. So just to show you this, all right, I'm going to cut this down a little bit just so I can put it all on the same line. So, like I said, I'm purposely moving this and putting it on the same line, or trying to. All right. So what the author has shown you, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But what I'm telling you is the other way that you could write this would be with a regular for loop, not with the enhanced for loop, but with a regular for loop. So here you'd say for int val equals 0, val less than numbers dot length val plus plus. So when you look at this, all I'm trying to show you here is that you can write this either way. All right? I'll leave that up there for just a second so you can see exactly what's going on. Is one preferred? If you're only reading through an array, this enhanced for loop is faster. If you plan on not only reading through the array, but possibly manipulating the values, changing a value or whatever, this is the way you want to go. All right. And as mentioned, when you work with this, start at zero, go to less than, not less than or equal to, or you'll get one of those off by one errors. So zero, less than the array name dot length. Okay. you can let a user specify the size of an array. So you can ask them. For example, I could say how many students are in my class. So I create the array here, but I'm not doing any initialization. I don't initialize it till I get down here because then I know how many students, tests, whatever it happens to be. An array reference can be assigned to another array of the same type, but notice int int all right and they talk about doing this it's not done very often so you know but they mention that if you if you basically move an array so here we've got int numbers equal new int 10 and then we assign numbers to a new array we make it 5 well notice it was 10 it's now 5 so now there's five elements in here that aren't going to be used anymore there were 10 now there are 5 so those last five get what are called garbage collected. And the way that I always give my analogy for a garbage collector is if you remember the days of a meter maid, that would be a man or a woman who would, you know, if you were parked in, a, in a, a parking lot that had, you know, or a parking area that had one hour parking, then maybe every hour a meter maid would come by and put a little chalk mark under your tire. If they came back an hour later, they knew you had been in that spot for more than an hour, so they'd give you a ticket. Well, in much the same way, when you, when you mark something for garbage collection, what you do is you tell the system, hey, this is garbage. So the garbage collector typically comes around and it says, oh, it flags that area as being ready for garbage collection. It doesn't remove it, but it flags it as being ready for garbage collection. Then when the, when the garbage collector comes around again, if there's been no activity on that thing it flagged, it gets rid of it. The other thing, just so you know this, again, I'm just trying to be complete here. When you're working with a garbage collector, just so you see this, you can do this. You can call system, system.gc. That's you physically calling the garbage collector. The problem is the garbage collector is something that runs under the, the guise or under the supervision of the operating system. And what it does is the operating system says, whenever you have a free millisecond here or there, run the garbage collector. So I can sit there, my garbage in my neighborhood comes on Tuesdays. I can sit out there on Wednesday and yell for the garbage collector, but they're still not going to come for another almost week. In much the same way, I can call a garbage collector like this. But what that does is it sends a, a message to the system, hey, when you get some time, 
please call the garbage collector. All right? When you copy an array from one array to the other, this does not work. You've got to copy arrays an element at a time. If you do this, if I create an array and then say another array equals that first one, what it does is now both of these, array one and array two, both point to the same array in, in memory. So in other words, what I've done here is I've created a copy. That's not even well put. It's not even a copy. I've created two things that point to the same array. All right. So when you want to create an array and copy it to another array, you've got to put it into a loop and copy it element by element. All right. When you pass a single element to an array, it's like passing any other variable. When you pass an entire array to a method, all right, you're passing an object. So any change you make is a permanent change. You can use the equal equal operator. As it says, it determines only whether an array points to the same object. So notice it says right here, this is a mistake. All right? Because I what what this is saying is, does both first array and second array, all right, doesn't say does the, do these arrays hold the same thing? It determines only whether the array points to the same object. In other words, even though these arrays have the same thing in them, they're two different arrays. So here, something like, what did we look at before? That would work, all right, if we said array one equal array two. But that would not work. All right. They show you in here how you can compare arrays. I'm going to go through an example that's much more extensive than this when we go through the actual code part and look through the book. Just so you know, one of the things I've decided is for each one of these programs, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about what's in the, the chapter when I go through the book lecture. But I, I hate sitting there and spending an hour going through what's in the book. So what I'll do is I'll go through it quickly, then I'll write a simple little program. And that's how we'll do these. So finding the highest number, finding the lowest number, these are the exact same thing, except this says highest and this says lowest. And this says greater than for highest. This says less than for, e for lowest. But they work the same way. Here's a very quick way to sum all the elements in an array. <clears throat> Here's a very quick way that you can do the average. Notice in this example, again, I really wish the author had been smart enough to come in here and say that should be really, in fact, let's just, that's not, I don't like to put stuff on the same line like this, but I just don't have enough room. So notice what I've done here. I just want to show you this. All right. So that will add up all the elements in an array. So will that. It's the same thing. But I want to do the averaging outside of the for loop because now I have my total and I want to divide them by the number of elements I have. You can have what's called a partially filled array. Just in case you don't need, you know, maybe you don't know how many elements are in it or maybe you're filling it up incrementally. You can work with, you know, and you can write array information to a file just like you write any other information to a file. You can return an, ar uh, uh, an array from a method. But notice when you do that, you've got to say not just double, but double bracket bracket to show that, it's in a, that it is an array. And then whatever you return must indeed be an array of that type. You can have an array of strings. So here's a list of names. And you'd set it up like this. Or if you wanted to initialize it from the get-go, you can do that too. If you don't initialize it, those values are null. So if you do it this way, then you've got to individually go in and set up each array name like this. Strings have a lot of, uh, string objects have a lot of different methods. If I want it, not only is there a two uppercase, but as you probably guess, there's a two lowercase to take everything that's in, a, in an array and make it uppercase or lowercase. There's a compare to 
which will allow you to compare values in an array to see if one is greater than the other, less than the other, or equal. There are e there's a equals that you could use for an array. We'll look at that in just a minute. You don't use the equal equal for equality and the char at, which is exactly, works virtually the same way as the char at that we used in JavaScript. Methods can be used by using the array name and index as before. So here's an example. <clears throat> Again, arrays have a field named length. You can't change that. So length can never appear on the left-hand side of an equal sign. Also, do not write parentheses after that. This is a property. It's not a method. All right. On the other hand, when you work with a string length, that is a method, so a string length does have parens after it. It's a little bit confusing. That's just the way they set it up. Here they're saying, let's create, let's create some bank accounts. So this assumes we've already created a bank account class, and now we're going to create an array of five bank accounts. Bank account, accounts sub zero, accounts sub one, accounts sub two, accounts sub three, and accounts sub four. And each one of those, as it says, needs to be initialized. So we can do this. This is going to call the constructor for each one of these. So in this case, we're assuming that it's going to set our initial balance to zero. All right, sequential search algorithm. With a sequential search algorithm, it goes through the array from beginning to end. If it finds what it's looking for, it stops. If it doesn't find it, it usually returns negative one. All right, to show that it wasn't there. Here's an example. Let's assume that somebody wants to find my phone number. You'd say, Jeff, that wouldn't be hard. I'd, you know, I live in Rockton, Illinois, so you'd have to find a Rockton phone book, go through it, look through the S's, you know, find the SC's, SCO, SCOTT, and see if there's a Jeffrey. Yeah, that makes sense. But imagine I gave you a Rockton phone number, but the names were not in ascending order. They were just thrown in there. So in the best case, I'm in there and I'm the first name that happens to be listed. In the second worst case, I'm the last name in there, so you've got to look through the whole book. In the worst case, you look through the whole book and I'm not there. So a sequential search can be very thorough and it works when the list is not in sorted order, but it's very, very slow. All right. Two-dimensional arrays. Kind of looks like a spreadsheet. Kind of works like a spreadsheet. But with spreadsheets, that's A, B, C, D, and that's 1, 2, 3, etc. But arrays are always done in a row column order. So as you go down, it's row 0, row 1, row 2, row 3, etc. And as you go across, it's column 0, column 1, column 2, column 3, etc. So this is row 0, column 0. This is row 3, column 3. And you know that since you have four rows and four columns, 4 times 4 is 16, so there are 16 elements in the array. When you create an array like this, you put two sets of brackets. The first one is for your rows, the number of rows. The second is for your number of columns. Anything that we've talked about as far as summing and getting averages, etc., that you did for one-dimensional arrays, you can do for arrays of any dimension. So notice how this is. Again, we go down row 0, row 1, row 2, column 0, column 1. So this is scores row 2, column 1 equals 95. Typically, if you want to do processing with nested loops, or I'm sorry, with, with multidimensional arrays, you use nested loops. Since it's a two-dimensional array, there's two sets of for loops. If it was a three-dimensional array, there would be three for loops. So what happens is you go through the row zero, and then you fill up all, four, all five columns. I'm sorry, all four columns. Then you go through row one, and you fill up all four columns, etc. Not only for inputting, but for outputting. Two sets of for loops. Two for loops. When you initialize, <clears throat> you set it up like this, so each set has its own set of curlies. You can do it like this. If you want, you can put it over three rows if it makes it more, more you know, easier for you to read, like this. 
Notice it says two-dimensional arrays are arrays of one-dimensional arrays. The length field gives the number of rows in the array. And each row has a length const constant that tells how many columns. Why? Because each row can have a different number of columns. So notice we've got here our first row has four columns, our second row has three columns, our third row has five columns. Sometimes those are called jagged edge arrays because they're all different sizes. <clears throat> Here's how you can sum the elements of a two-dimensional array. Again, the thing is you need two for loops. Okay. Here's how you sum the columns. Again, two for loops. There's no difference between passing a one-dimensional or two-dimensional or an array of any size. The method must accept a two-dimensional array, though. And when you put it in here, all right, it's going to look a little bit different in the method. We'll look at that a little bit later. <clears throat> well, again, when the rows of a two-dimensional array are of different lengths, it's known as a ragged array. Okay? You can have arrays of more than two dimensions. Here's a three-dimensional array. And as it says, if you've got more than three dimensions, it's hard to visualize. But depending on the complexity of the problem, you might want to use it. All right? All right, they talk a little bit about sorting in here. And when you do a selection sort, as it says, you go through the whole array, you find the smallest element, and you move it to element 0. Then you go through the array again, but you don't start with element 0. You now start with element 1, because you know that element 0 already holds the smallest element. And you keep doing that. And there is an example in the book, too. A binary search is called a halving search, H-A-L-V-I-N-G. So in other words, if I have, take a real simple you know, look at this. If I have an array, <clears throat> and that array has 10 elements in it, 26, 33, 156, 76, 88, 100, 0. 99, 1, negative 2. That's what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's 10. Well, that won't work right there. That won't work for a selection sort. Or I'm sorry, for a <clears throat> binary search. The numbers have to already be sorted. So we'd say negative 2, 0, 1, 26, hopefully I'm not missing any, 33, <clears throat> uh, 88, no, 76, 88, 99, 100, <clears throat> and 156. Now, I want to know if the number 50 is in this array. Now, if I use this array, I'd have to go from the beginning to the end, so I'd have to check every element, and then i find out, no, it's not in here. Here, what I do is I go halfway into the array. So I go to about element 5, and I say, is that 50? If it is, I've found it. Well, most of the time, it won't be. So I say, fine. <clears throat> is the number greater than or less than this number? Well, it's greater. So I know by looking and giving it one swoop, that number, that number, that number, that number, and that number are both out of it. So in one look, I've gotten rid of half the possibilities. So I look at what's left, and I check the one in the middle. And I say, is that 50? No. OK. So is it greater than, is, is this number greater than or less than 50? It's less than. So now I know these three numbers are out. So in two looks, I know it's either this number, or it's this number, or I can't find it. OK. So in four checks here, I know that that number is not there. That's what you do when you use a binary search. So the stuff must already be in ascending order. You start with the middle of the array. If, that's, if you found the element you're looking for, your search is over. Otherwise, you see whether it's greater than or less than that number. If it's greater, you search the bottom half. If the number you're looking for is less, you search the upper half. All right, and you repeat it as needed. <clears throat> All right. We're coming close to the end of the chapter here. And as you can see, we're talking about right here, this is when you work with main.
the bracket bra string bracket bracket arcs. So main receives or can receive, it really does receive, um, a list of arguments. The, the zero at their first argument is always the name of the program. But you can pass other things in too. So notice what we have here. If from a command line we typed in this, how does this work? All right. And I think that's wrong. I, th I always thought at least that, that parameter zero was the name of the program. I could be wrong. All right, but here they're saying zero, one, two, three type of an idea. You can also pass in a variable number by saying dot, dot, dot. The reason that that's nice is in this example right here, what they're saying is I could pass in an array of any size and add them up. Okay? All right, we're near the end of the chapter. Now we're going to talk about an array list. So everything for these first 65 out of 75 PowerPoints talked about an array list, which, again, is set at compile time, so it's early binded. The last 10 slides talk about an array list, which is set at runtime, so it's late binded. So as the big thing is an array list can automatically expand or shrink as new items are added to it or removed from it. Notice it's a different syntax. You say array list, and then inside of angle brackets, you put the type. So this says that an array list called name list can hold string objects. If we try to store anything in there that's not a string, we'll get an error. You use the add method to populate the list. So here it would be putting in two of those names into the list. The size method gives you the current size of the list. You can use get to access any method that's in there. Notice, as it says, there's a two-string method that we can use if we want to print out the information that's in there. There's a remove method that we can use to remove elements from a list. The key thing with, it, with, with an array list is you can set it up so that initially it has a certain number of elements in it. And then typically, when you reach the end of that, it just doubles in size automatically. That's the key thing. All right? To insert elements at a specific location, you use add and tell it where to go. To replace an element, instead of using add, you, you say set. So as it says, that would replace Mary with Becky. An array list has a capacity. The default is 10, so when it reaches 10, it will automatically be doubled to 20. But you can set a new capacity when you do this if you want to. Here we're setting it to 100. Once we reach 100, it will automatically be doubled to 200. You can store any type of simple variable in, in an array list or any type of object in an array list. So as it said right there, this creates an array list that holds bank account objects. Here's a very simple example of how you could use different bank account objects. And again, you use that diamond operator. That's it for this chapter. I'll be back in a matter of moments. And when I do, I'm going to go over the next chapter. Now we will talk about a second look at classes and objects. So I'll be back with that particular example shortly.